It's 1986. Perhaps you're taking a course in Pascal somewhere. Maybe it's the AP computer science course that was available in the US for a while. Or maybe you're taking Pascal in college or trade school, or you just want to learn it to, to get some better skills. Either way, you needed a way to practice your Pascal skills at home. And if you had a Commodore 64, Abacus Super Pascal was a product for you. And at the time, it sold for about 60 US dollars. If you want to code along with this video, you're going to want to get the compiler and the language documentation. And there are links for both in the description below. The Super Pascal manual states that it is a complete implementation of the standard Pascal language as defined in this book, Pascal User Manual Report. Make sure you're using the second edition of the book. There's an Appendix E that contains the descriptions of the compiler errors that they've taken out in further editions of that book. And without that information, it can make it really hard to troubleshoot your programs and while they're not compiling. A link to an archived copy of the software is also provided below, and it's in G64 format. This is like the D64 image, but it packs in extra information so emulators can work with copy protected disks. So let's get started. For this video, I'm using the wonderful Vice emulator, uh, and I'm emulating two 1541.2 disk drives. The Pascal system comes in one disk and a portion of it is copy protected. We will leave the Pascal disk in drive eight and drive nine contains a blank disk for source code and compiled output. So let's take a quick look at what we have here. As you can see in drive nine, it's an empty formatted disk for our projects. And in drive eight, we have the Pascal disk and there's only two files on it. It doesn't appear to be anything but a boot program, and you're correct, that's pretty much all that we're able to see. Super Pascal is a complete operating environment with its own DOS and disk format. The disk has a C64 DOS compatible directory layout, which is just enough for us to boot into the system. You'll notice that the file name is Pascal Arrow Boot. The arrow looks like a typo here, but it's actually intentional. The Pascal language and environment and runtime makes a lot of use of underscores, and the Commodore 64 does not have an underscore key. So in its place, we're going to use the back arrow key. If you were to copy and paste an underscore key from the ASCII character set onto the Commodore, it mapped to the back arrow key, and that's why the back arrow key was chosen. All right, let's boot this thing up. And we use a typical lodestar, comma 8, comma 1 to do that. Press any key to move on to the next screen. And it just takes a few moments to load up. All right, and now we're at the Pascal system menu. So we're gonna use the M key from this menu, map drive, and this serves two purposes. It gives us a directory of the disk so we can see what's on it. And it also changes the default drive for future commands. You'll notice it's asking which drive and it defaults to zero. In the Pascal system, they use device zero and one. Zero is drive eight, one is drive nine. It cannot see anything beyond that. So let's press enter and take a look at what's on our system disk. So now that we're in the Pascal system, we can see what's truly on a disk. So first you'll notice there are files in reverse video. The files in reverse video are locked files. These files are read only, they cannot be deleted and they cannot be overwritten. Each file name can contain up to eight characters. There's a naming scheme referenced in the manual where C underscore in a file name, and remember our back arrows are underscores, refer to compiled code. These are programs that I should be able to just load and run. Files that start with an S underscore or source code files that we can load into our editor and compile code from. You can see that convention is not always followed because here you can see main, sysgen, and lodat are just regular file names. Now let's run this map command on drive one, which is drive nine, to see what our blank disk looks like. And we're gonna get a cryptic error message, floppy error in $F35D. What that means is that disk is not formatted for Super Pascal, so we need to format it. You could see on our screen a reverse video, a program called sysgen. That is the program we want to run to format a new system disk. So we're gonna use the R run program command. We're gonna type in sysgen, and we're gonna choose drive zero, of course. And it's gonna run that command off of drive zero. Okay. 
So it's going to ask us which drive do we want to make a system disk out of, and we're going to choose drive one. And like file names, the disk title can be up to eight characters. So we'll call it projects. All right, this process takes a few minutes. Another interesting thing to note is that Super Pascal only works with 1541 compatible disk drives. It will not recognize a 1571 and 1571 mode. It will not recognize a 1581 drive. If you try to use a 1581 drive and prepare a system disk, the system just crashes. So this is purely for 1541 drives. This process doesn't take too long. The first part was it going track by track, uh, formatting it for Pascal system. And this part that it's on now is copying the basic kernel onto the disk. Okay, it's gonna show us a map of the disk. We're going to choose no, we do not want to repeat this with another disk. We're gonna use the utility menu to explore the disk in more detail. So we're gonna press U and that's gonna launch the utility uh, program off of drive eight or drive zero. This manual contains a lot of commands for directly manipulating the disk. And now let's take a look at the map again, even though we just saw it a moment ago of drive one of our new disk. So here we could see that the disk is called projects. That's what we named it. In reverse video, there's that load that file. This is essentially the kernel of the Pascal system. It needs to exist on every system disk that you create. This disk has 35 blocks free. Each block in Super Pascal disk format is 4K. And each one of those blocks is divided into eight 256 byte sectors. A disk starts with 40 blocks. One block is used by the system directory. That brings us down to 39. And low data is four blocks. So we have 35 blocks left. So there's another interesting command on utilities menu is the block table command. And this will give us a visual layout of the blocks on a disk. Here we could see that there was four rows of 10 blocks. And we can clearly see the I, which is invalid, which is where the directory structures and the block allocation map and all that kind of database stuff is stored. We can see the four use blocks of load that and then everything else is free. So let's quit out of this program for now. So I'm gonna clear the screen. If you forget where you are, you can always press H and it'll tell you what program you're in and what commands are available. All right, let's move on to our first actual code. We're gonna use the E command to launch the editor. Uh, the editor works very similar to Commodore Basic in which you manage the source code with line numbers. So to get started, we're gonna press the N key to have it automatically number our lines as we key them in. And as you can see, it starts at line 1000. So the very first line of your program needs to be program and then the name of the output file, in which case we're gonna call ours test. And then you end that with a semicolon. And the next line is the word begin. This tells the compiler that after the word begin and until you see the word end, these are statements of code that we're gonna run. They are gonna be functions, they're gonna be uh, procedures, etc. So we're gonna call a function called a write line. And by its name, you probably figured out this is gonna write text to the screen and then press enter for us. Uh, Pascal uses single quotes to put text in. So we can type in hello world, single quote, close enter and then in this line we're going to use the word end with a dot and then we'll press enter enter and now we're back into the editor so uh, pretty straightforward program test the output will be test uh, between begin and end is one statement and we're calling a function called write line to print hello world to the screen so now we want to save this now we want to save it to drive 9 because we've just launched the editor the system is defaulted back to drive 8 so we need to press the M key to choose drive one, which is drive nine. And it's gonna show us a directory of it and it's more or less empty. And we're gonna use a P command to put the source to save it to drive nine. And we're gonna call it S back arrow test. And we're gonna press enter. And remember back arrows are like underscores. So imagine it's us underscore test. So now we saved our project. Now let's compile it. So we're gonna quit out of the editor. 
we're going to press C to launch the compiler. For the file title, I can type in S underscore test, but instead I can also type in an asterisk. This will default it to the last file name we worked with in a previous program. So we're going to press yes. And at this point, it's going to launch the compiler, ask us a few questions, and then compile our source code. So just want to mention, I'm going to run the first compilation of our code at full speed. And I use the word speed in big quotes. So you can see how slow the process is. Going forward, I'm going to edit it all out. So it's going to look like it's super fast, but I assure you it is not. It's asking us if we would like to use the default options. So it's going to press enter for yes. It is now going to compile the source code. And the first thing we're going to see pop on the screen is the memory address of where our first line of code is being compiled to. And there it is at 0848. Um, Abacus Pascal actually builds all software to 0800. However, there's, you know, whatever stuff it needs in the beginning before our code runs. And that's what's before the 0848. Our compilation is complete. Uh, we don't really care about a statistical summary. It will now link and save our source code to our binary file that we put into the program line, which was the word test. And now we're back at the main menu. So to run this program, you use the R command. And again, you can type in the word test and drive one, or we can use an asterisk and the asterisk will run the code that, was, that has just been compiled to memory. And you can see the word hello world there. It then says, okay. And then it brings us back to the menu. So there we've compiled and run our first program. So let's jump into the editor and make some, uh, some quality of life changes to it. So now we're in the editor. We need to map back to drive one. And then we're going to use the G command to load our source code back in. And it works by typing G colon S backslash test, S back arrow test. We're going to use the L command to list it. And there's our program. So let's add a couple of things to this. We ran our program, it kind of just printed on a screen and a menu came up. It would be nice if we cleared the screen before a program ran. So if this were Commodore Basic, you would probably go into quote mode and press, you know, clear to do that. Because Pascal uses single quotes, we really can't get into quote mode. So you have to use uh, the chr command, the chr function rather, to print characters by their ASCII value. 147 is the ASCII value for clear screen. Now in a world of readability, uh, I call those magic numbers. Like I know it's 147 because as you can see here in the Commodore Programmer's Reference Guide, there it is, the clear screen command. But as you can see, there's all these other numbers for color uh, white, color red, and moving the cursor and all these other things. It would be easier for our source code to refer to it by a constant. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna add a constant to this program so we can assign the number 147 to an easy to see word. And what we're gonna do that is between program and begin, we're gonna create a section for constants and you use the C-O-N-N-S-T, um, a call to command. And then under that, we can declare our constants. So we're gonna call this one, we're gonna call this one CLR SCN clear screen. And we're gonna assign it the value of 147 and we'll use a semicolon, all right? So if we look at this program, we have a constant section and we have a statement section now. That whole section of code between 1002 and 150 and 1015 is called the program block. That is a block of code that is our program. So now how do we use this constant? Well, instead of typing 147 here, we can delete this and we can use clear screen and it'll put the number 147 in it. So when we run this program, it will clear the screen and write the word hello world and then it'll end and then it'll print the menu it would also be kind of nice if we waited for a key press when the program is done outputting text so we can examine it before we go back to the menu so we're going to introduce a function that we're going to call that will wait for a key press and that function is called get key however get key returns a character and in pascal if a function returns something, you have to consume it. Now, we don't really care about the key. We're just looking for a key to, to just ignore and move on. But we do have to assign the, uh, the function to a variable. So 
So we need to create a variable section. Now, I want to put it between 1003 and 1005, but as you could see, we don't really have enough room to add uh, two more lines of code. So looking at the menu here, there is a command called R for renumber. And if you press that, it renumbers our program by five starting at a thousand. So now we can put at 1011 a VAR section, and that stands for variables. Variables are uh, variables, of course, that can change values of program runs. And the way that you define a variable is you give it a name. So we'll just call this, um, I don't know, C. And then you put a colon, and then what type of data we're storing into it. And here we're going to be storing a CHAR or a character. All right. So if we list our, so if we list our program, we now have a constant section, a variable section, and a statement section between begin and end. So let's use this now. So at 10.22, we're going to say C colon equals get key. So let's talk about functions for just a moment. When you call a function in Pascal, you use parentheses when you're passing it variables. If you have a function that does not receive variables like get key, instead of putting an empty set of parentheses, you have to put no parentheses. That takes a little getting used to if you're coming from languages like JavaScript, C, or, or Java, or C Sharp, or pretty much any language, really. <laughs> um, so now let's talk about statements. In our program now, we have two statements. We're calling right line at 1020, and we're calling get key at line 1022. In between each statement in Pascal, you must use a semicolon, and these are called statement separators. So I'm going to put a semicolon here. All right. You don't have to put a semicolon at the end of each line, just in between statements. If you've come from JavaScript or Java or any C-based language, uh, semicolons are statement terminators. We have to put them at the end of each line. In Pascal, you put them between lines. So in Pascal, think of statements as like a list of things that you would separate with commas. You wouldn't put a comma at the end of this list. You'd end it like that. Think of the statement separator as the same thing. Instead of A, B, C, and D, those are statements, right line and get key, etc. So let's talk about comments. Maybe I want to put a comment describing my program at the very top. Comments in Pascal are normally done by surrounding text in curly braces. Well, if you've looked at a Commodore 64 keyboard, you'll notice that there are no curly braces on the Commodore 64 keyboard. Pascal gives you an alternate way to do comments with open parenthesis, asterisk, and then we could put our comment text here, you say uh, our first program, and you can end it with asterisk, close parenthesis. So now when this is our program, we have a little description at the top and the rest of it. Now comments can also span multiple lines. So for example, if I wanted to make this take three lines, and I'll just kind of clone those lines. So we can make our comments look a little prettier by putting the starting of our comment here. We could put our text on this line possibly. And then we can make this part here just the end comment marker. We're going to renumber this to make it look a little nicer. So now it's starting to look like something. You may want to use blank lines to maybe separate some of these spaces a bit, right? So we have our program test. We've got a constant section. We've got a var section. Uh, I feel like we should have a space between the C character line and begin. So you would think you'd do 1036 and just put a space and press enter. And if you list it, you'll notice it didn't create that line. But what you can do, hold down a shift key and press space, and that's going to put in a non-breaking space. So now when you list it, it'll keep the blank line there. So you can visually separate your code with blank lines if that's something that you like for your coding style. All right, let's save this and give this a shot. Now, because we loaded this file with our file name, when we use the P command, we can use asterisk, and it remembers what we loaded in. So you don't have to remember what file you're in also. So we're going to press Y. We're going to overwrite that file. And then we're going to compile it using the asterisk again. And then we can run our program now. And now it clears the screen and it waits for us to type a key. And now we're back at the menu. 
So let's create a new program. We're going to do that by jumping into the editor. The goal of this new program is to uh, explore the for loop, and we're going to explore it by creating a program that writes directly to the screen. We're going to fill the screen with each letter of the alphabet, A's, B's, C's, all the way up to Z. So let's give this a try. So we're going to create a new program by using the N key to start at line 1000. We're going to call it loops because we're going to do some for loops here. So we're going to create a variable section and we're going to have a screen code that's going to be an integer. And we're going to have the memory address that we're writing to also as an integer. All right, so let's begin our program section. And the way for loops work is you say for, you take the variable that already exists. You can't declare a variable here. You have to use one that's already available. We're going to say equals 1, 2, 26, do. So what this line of code does is starts at 1, assigns at 1 to the screen code variable, and then runs the statement. And then it assigns 2 and all up to 26. What this statement is going to do is say for address equals 1024 to 2023. And this is also going to do a statement. 1024 is the memory address of the screen. And the screen code, if you look in the program's reference guide, uh, the screen codes are they're different than ASCII codes when you write directly to the screen. Uh, screen code 1 is an A, 2 is a B, etc. And you can see them here on this page. And we're just going to go through every single memory address and plop an A in every single spot. And then we'll do a B, then we'll do a C. So how do we write to the screen? they give you an array. I'm going to call it a magic array called MEM. The memory contains 65,536 entries where each entry maps to a memory address in the Commodore. So you can read and write to anything by reading uh, from the array or writing to it. So we're going to write to memory and we're going to pass an address as the index. So it's basically like the equivalent of poke if you compare it to basic. And we're going to assign it the value of screen code. Okay, and then we're going to have an end here. So this is a very simple program. Again, it's just going to iterate through each letter of the alphabet. And for each letter of the alphabet, it's going to go through each memory address on the screen, all 1,000 positions. Because remember, there's 40 columns across, 25 lines down, 40 times 25 is 1,000. And we're going to fill each one of those with the letter. And then our program is going to end. So let's compile this and see what happens. Nope, we don't want to quit without saving, and I'm glad it asked me. Uh, we're going to map to drive one, and we're going to put s uh, underscore or arrow loops. So now we've saved our code. So let's compile this. And our compilation fails with an error 145. So at the beginning of the video, I mentioned that you need a copy of the Pascal user manual and report to understand what these error codes are. These error numbers are not defined in the Abacus Super Pascal manual that comes with it. So without this book, you're kind of left to guess as to what that is. So if I look at the errors here, and you can see uh, in Appendix E, it lists all the numbers and what the errors are. Error 145 is type conflict. Now it's pointing to the word end in the last line of code, but that's actually not where the problem is. Now, one of the neat things about the way this compiler works is when it fails, if you press run stop, it's going to break out of the compiler, load the editor with the source code. So it kind of saves us a step so we can get right to fixing it without too much delay. Okay, so we're going to list this out. So the real problem is at the end of line 1035, where we assign screen code into address. Let me explain. An integer in Pascal is a 16-bit value. Well, that makes sense for an address. 16-bit values contain numbers between 0 and 65,535. But memory addresses need an 8-bit value. And because screen code is a 16-bit value, we can't just assign it to a memory address. We need to convert that to an 8-bit value. Luckily, it's really simple. There's a function called low. And if we pass screen code into that function low, it will convert that to an 8-bit value. 
And the way it does that is it just takes the low byte and passes that. And of course, the low byte is the numbers between 0 and 255. Well, you only need 1 through 26. That's, that's perfect for us. And the high byte portion of the integer is just stripped away. So let's save this. And we'll do p colon star to save it. We'll replace it. And now it should work perfect. Okay, we're going to choose no for the summary. And now it's ready to go. So before we run this program, let's compare it to the basic equivalent of the same program. So in the right window here, you see the same code in basic where we're looping from characters 1 to 16. We're looping through address 10, 24 to 20. 23, we're poking A with C, and then the two next commands will let the loops run. So let's run this in basic, and then we're going to run our Pascal program just to get an idea of how Pascal compares to basic with performance. So let's run a basic program here. And we'll even give basic a little bit of a head start. It's got the A, it's working on B, and now we're going to run our Pascal version of this program. And as you can see, clearly the Pascal version just smokes the basic version. So this should give you a pretty good idea of how fast the Pascal code is compared to basic. Now, of course, it's nothing like machine language, and we'll address that shortly, but definitely much, much quicker than basic. And that's it. And basic is still only up to I. So here we are looking at a program that fills the screen with the letters of the alphabet. Let's break this up into a procedure call so we can reuse the code possibly for something else. So we're going to take lines 1030 and 1035 and move that into a procedure that takes one parameter, a code, to fill the screen with. So at 1100, we're going to declare a procedure and we're going to call it fill SCN and it's going to take in a code that is an integer. Procedures, like the program, um, have their own block where we can define variables and constants and etc. just for the procedure. So we're going to start the statement section for our procedure block with the word begin. And basically it's the same code on line 1030, right? So we're going to take the address from 1024 to 2023, we're going to do, and then we're going to say mem address equals the low value of code, and code is the 16-bit value passed in. Again, we're converting it to an 8-bit value and putting it into an address. And then you end the statement section with a procedure with end semicolon. End dot is for ending programs. An end semicolon will end any other type of statement section. Okay, so let's get rid of 1035. And we're going to make 1030, instead of looping through the address, it's going to call our procedure. And we're going to pass it screen code. So let's take a look at this code, and this is what it looks like now. So one minor problem here with this code, the way it's written, you can only call procedures if they're defined before where they're used. Unfortunately, our procedure is after the program, so the fill screen statement on line 1030 will fail to compile. So we need to move the block of code from 1100 to 1140 up above. And here's how you do that. I'm going to press H here. There's a command here called S, shift line. And the way shift line works is you type S, the range of lines that we want to shift up, so 1100 to 1140. You put a colon, and then you tell it where you want to put it. Well, we want to put it right around line 1017, which is after the section where variables for the program are defined, but before the actual program code starts. So we're going to put in 1017. I'm going to press Enter. And I'm going to clear the screen and relist it. And you'll see a couple interesting things here. It correctly moved our procedure up, which is nice, but it also renumbered our program, so everything fits in pretty well. So now we've got quite a bit of stuff here, and we have that situation where it's not as easy to read. So I'm going to insert some blank lines into our code to kind of break things up so we can visually see it better. So I'm going to put a blank line at 1017, and again, I'm pressing shift space for non-breaking space. And I want to put one at 1042. So when we list our program here, it's a little bit easier to see in the eye. We can more visually see the different sections of code. Okay, let's save our code with p colon star. Let's compile this. Default options. 
Don't really want a summary. It's gonna link it now. And we'll run our code again, just to make sure it still works. And it still works, fantastic. So as you can see, Pascal filling the screen with the for loops is much faster than basic. But what's even faster than basic? Machine language. With Abacus Pascal, we can create procedures that are actually written in machine language and integrates relatively seamlessly into our Pascal code. So let's make a version of the procedure fill SCN, but written in assembler. Here's how it works. First, we declare the procedure, just like normal, fill ASM, with one slight change. It's going to take in a byte instead of an integer. And then a next line of code, instead of writing begin, like you would normally do for procedure, you write in assemble and a semicolon. When the Pascal compiler sees that word assemble, it switches to an assembler and it runs a semi language until it sees .en. So here's what the code for this would look like. So as we can see here, we have a procedure, fill ASM, takes code as a byte, it turns the assembler on and then it runs this code. So I'm not really gonna teach assembler here, but I'm gonna to explain to you what's happening here. The first two lines of assembly language um, load the byte that's passed into procedure into the accumulator. And the way that it does that is it loads the Y index register with a zero. STKPOI is a stack pointer, and that is a equate given to you by the assembler, and it's a zero page address, and it points to an address that points to the stack. <laughs> so Loading accumulator, look at the address in the stack pointer, um, add y to zero, and grab that value and put it in the accumulator. So that's what that does. So now the accumulator has the screen code we passed in. The next bucket code between 2030 and 2065 is a loop that takes the accumulator and puts it to every single memory location between 1024 and 2023 on the screen. The next block of code between 2070 and 2080 adjusts the stack pointer by one to complete, uh, and I'll put this in quotes, popping the value off of the stack. When a procedure is called, the stack pointer moves down one and they put the byte on a stack. We consumed it at the top, and now we have to move the stack pointer back up one. It's a 16 bit address, so the first part increments the low value by one. If the low value uh, flips over to zero, it then needs to add the high value by one. And then at the end of that, we RTS, and that brings control back to Pascal. And like I said before, the .en tells Pascal that we're done with assembly language. So like previously, because fill ASM needs to be called after it's defined, we need to move the section statement from 1055 to 1070 to the end. So we're gonna use our S command again, 1055 to 1070, and we're gonna put it at 2100. And now that we list our code, we need to make one more final change where instead of calling fill SCN, we're gonna call fill ASM. And instead of passing screen code because it needs a byte, we need to convert this to the low byte. Uh, and that's it. So now I'm gonna list our code here and we're gonna get rid of the old procedure. We no longer need it. So we can delete 1025 through 1050, all right? And now we have our program written using Pascal, and our fill screen function is written in assembler. So let's save this. And let's run it through the compiler and see how the compiler behaves differently now that we have assembler code in it. Default options, so far like normal. And now the assembler kicks in and it gives you a little warning that it's gonna ignore certain pseudo ops. You can actually write full assembly language by itself, but since we're using in Pascal source, a few of the um, pseudo ops are ignored. No errors in our assembler, which is great. So, as you could tell, it's a two pass assembler. And then it continues back to compiling our Pascal code. Excellent, uh, don't really care about a statistical summary. It's gonna save and it's going to link and save it. Now let's see how much faster this is with our assembly language procedure. 
Whoa, it was so quick you barely saw it. Let me run it again. That is that is really, really cool. So as you can see now, our code is getting a little bit cluttered. We have our normal Pascal code and with this big block assembler in the middle. It would be nice if we can cut that assembler code and put it into its own file to make our project a little bit more readable. So to do that, we're gonna, we're gonna scrape away all the other lines of code except for the procedure that has the assembler in it. So let's start deleting stuff. Let's start deleting 1110 on. Then let's delete 1000 to 1020. So now we have just the assembler code. All right, I'm gonna put this into a file called S fill. All right, let's go get our source code and let's remove that content from our main project. So now in here, we're gonna do the opposite. We're gonna delete 1025 to 1105. And then here on line 1020, we're just going to use a new command called include and type it include, and then you put the name of the file in. All right, so let's save that. And now our code is much easier to read. And of course, let's make sure it compiles. So the compiler, of course, will include our source code file. That source code file will trip the assembler and the assembler should kick in. There it goes. Two passes, and then we come back to our Pascal code. And if you're curious what the statistical summary looks like, this is what it shows you. Nothing terribly useful in my opinion. All right, and of course, does it still run? Still runs. So now we're at a point where we have our application and we want to put it into a form that other users can take and, and run it and run it very easily. So our goal would be able to have a disk where a user could type load star coming comma one and it would load our program and run it. So this part is actually not documented in the manual for Pascal system 5.3. I found it in a manual to a different product. But here's how you do it. We're gonna go to the utility program. I'm gonna map drive one. And if you remember, this is our project disk where our source code and compiled binaries went to. And loops is a program that we wanna make auto start when someone loads comma eight comma one. So we're gonna use the R command to rename loops to the word startup. And now we're gonna restart the computer and see how it behaves. At this point, I've taken a disk out of drive nine and I've put it into drive eight. So drive eight has our program on it. So here's what it looks like when you distribute it to somebody. So we load star commit comma one. You get this menu. Notice how it's a little different than when we booted up the development environment. You don't see the Abacus logo. You see the data Becker logo. And here you could see that our program automatically started, it ran, and it left us at the menu. Pretty cool. Abacus Super Pascal is a nice development environment for making programs with the Pascal and assembly language. It's great to be able to work in a structured language and then be able to drop down to assembly language when high performance is needed. The incredibly slow speed of the 1541 disk drive really do hold the power of this package back though. Compiling multi-file programs is just dreadfully slow. On the plus side though, when your code does fail to compile, it brings you straight to the editor with the source code. If I recall correctly though, the first few wizardry games for the Commodore 120 and 64 were written in Pascal, although I'm not sure which compiler they used for the 64 and 128 versions. Those games do demonstrate that it is possible to write highly entertaining software with this language though. While I'm happy that we covered the core features of the development environment in this video, I really wish I had more time to dive deeper into the Pascal language itself. With that said, I'm already thinking of a follow-up video to this where we'll cover functions, file I.O., records, and pointers. But that video will be with a different Pascal system, and I think you're going to really enjoy it. So keep your eyes out for it. 
Thanks again for everyone that watched this video. I truly, truly appreciate it. Take care.